Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of In a Nutshell, brought to you by the Covenant Nation Manchester. My name is Dr. Njoku, and I'm going to carry on from the discussion we had last week about the topic, Others May, I Cannot, I Cannot, It's Consecration That Deep. And to start us off, I would like you to imagine with me for a moment. Okay, so let's get your imagination rolling. So let's imagine with me this. You are 11 or 12 years old, okay? You just finished off primary school um, and you're having conversations with your classmates and everyone is saying, oh, we're going to this secondary school down the road. Well, my parents are taking me to a boarding school or I'm going to a private school. All of that is going on. And everybody's in the excitement of it and you're not 100% sure why. And they're looking at you and wondering why you're not contributing. And genuinely, you have no idea where you're going to for your secondary school. So you run back home as soon as the bell goes in school and you're like, Mom, where am I going to for secondary school? And your mom says, oh, my darling, I'm really sorry. Please sit down. I, I should have told you this a while back. But you will be traveling back to Nigeria um, to work in the church. And of course, your 12-year-old brain doesn't make sense of it. And you're like, what exactly is going on? Um... So anyway, what you interpret is that you're going to school in you're going to school in Nigeria. I mean, this is assuming that you grew up in in the UK, for example. And so, summer comes, beginning of the year starts, academic year starts in September, and then instead of going to school with your friends, everybody's asking where you're going. You're saying you're going to Nigeria, and then you go back to Nigeria, and your job is to work in the church office as a full time staff. And everybody in the church office is like double your age, you know, and you had sent to the Covenant Nation. So, so let's go with the Covenant Temple in Lekki. That's that's where you've been sent to. Um, and as you land, your parents take you to Pastor Podju and he says, he tries to explain to you, uh, take you around the church. This is where this happens. This is where that happens. This is where that happens. Um, you're miles away from home, and but your life is so busy, you don't even have the time to miss home, except the tears that wet your pillow when you fall back to sleep at night. Okay, you are just from the sheer exhaustion of working in an office that intense, you know, for a big ministry like the Covenant Nation. And then you see your family only once a year when they come for Wolfbeck. That's the only time you see your family. Think with me for a moment. Who do you think I might be referring to? Uh, we'll come back to that question, but let's carry on. The topic we're looking at is others may, I cannot. Is consecration that deep? So others may be off to boarding school, others may be off to private school, others may be off to all sorts of different places, others may be off to maybe even uh, military school, for example, but you're back in Nigeria working in church, not even working in some what you might call like a nice place that you can brag on Instagram and say, oh, I'm working in this place. Um, so we'll come back to that story, like I said earlier. So what I, the first thing I kind of looked at while considering this topic was what does consecration actually mean? What does the dictionary definitions entail? So first, consecration has been defined. This is me amalgamating different definitions to say it's an art of making or declaring something sacred, making something holy, making something um, set apart, separated from profane or what you might term secular use, um, dedicated to the service and the worship of God to be given entirely to a specific person, activity, or course. Um, and for me personally, in considering a topic like this, I would normally, the first thing I would think is, what does the Bible say about consecration? So my first example is Samson, who most of you would have heard, either in movies or via reading um, the Bible or Sunday school when you were much younger. So I'm going to read a couple of verses from Judges um, 13, verses 2 to 5, where it says, And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine, nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing, for lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son. And no razor shall come upon his head, for the child will be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of, Philist of the Philistines. Okay, so at that time in Israel, they were going from one judge to another judge. They didn't have a king yet, so Saul hadn't come into the picture. And they were constantly being oppressed by one nation. Then they will cry out to God and God will deliver them. And they will go back into sin and then they will cry out to God and God will deliver them. So Samson, whose name we found out later, this young man being born was for the purpose of delivering Israel out of the hand of their current oppressors. Who, was, who were the Philistines. So that translation ran that bit in verse 5 as he shall be dedicated to God from the womb or belong to God from the time he's born. So his assignment was to deliver the children of Israel from the hand of the Philistines. And that is why he was going to not have his hair cut, not drink any wine, not drink any strong drink, 
like real you can say ogogoro if you will for those of us who understand that term if you don't understand it just delete or eat anything that's unclean now, if you think about this in line with how what god said to the levites about how they were meant to consecrate themselves to god for the service as priests for the children of israel you realize there were three primary things they were supposed not to do so not cut their hair they were not supposed to be around any dead body at all and even if that happened that made them unclean and they were not meant to drink strong drink or strong wine either so it's kind of similar in this whole thing about consecration. So back to the topic, others may I cannot is consecration that DPS it is. The assignment on Samson's life was for God's people to be delivered. If he broke any of those, if you call it statutes or any of those requirements, he no longer qualified to do what God had asked him to do. And if you read through the story, you will realize that eventually he did fall, yes, but they, there was something so much upon his life to carry out that thing that his hair, if you will, was the thing that was consecrated to God primarily. Okay, um, so yes, consecration is that deep because there was a, there's an assignment to be fulfilled. So remember the picture I painted at the beginning asked you to imagine yourself as this 12 year old that instead of going to secondary school was being sent to work in the church office where everybody in the church office was like double your age and you're just trying to find your way through it. Nobody is as young as you are. Everybody's surprised by what, what you're even doing there. No one really understands. You probably have guessed who I'm referring to by this point. I hope you have. Um, so my second example Drum roll. Okay, yes, it's Samuel. So our other example is Samuel in 1 Samuel 1, where we read the story of how Samuel was born. So again, another case of barrenness. So it's like, this. you can almost say, is there a thing about not getting a child when you're meant to get, get it that brings in what God wants to do on the earth in that, in that season? So we have the story of Hannah, who was the second wife to somebody called Elkanah. And she was also barren. And she had a, what would you call, like a co-wife called um, Penina who was bearing child after child after child. So Hannah was barren and she was sad. I mean, the average person would be sad not being able to have children after such a long time that she had no son. So in her desperation for wanting a, wanting a child, wanting a boy, the Bible says they went to the temple at regular times. And she, after the whole ceremonies was over, she was there, you know, praying to God. Her mouth was moving, but there was no words coming out. And um, the priest at that time was someone called Eli, who saw her and said, lady, put the, drunk, put the drink away from you. You must be drunk because I can't hear what you're, what you're praying. And she said, no, uh, my Lord, I'm not, I'm not drunk. I'm a woman that whose heart is heavy. Um, so she made that vow to dedicate the first son God gives her to God. Um, and Eli said, okay, be it unto you in, in, in many words, be it unto you according to your faith type of thing. So we read the story again, just a few verses from 1 Samuel chapter 1. I'm reading four verses in 10 to 11 and 27 to 28. She was very upset. So verse 10 says she was very upset as she prayed to the Lord and she was weeping uncontrollably. She made a vow saying, O Lord of hosts, if you will look with compassion on the suffering of your female servants, remembering me and not forgetting your servants and give a male child to your servant, then I will dedicate him to the Lord all the days of his life. His hair will never be cut. Okay. And then verse 27 and 28 says, so this was after Eli had said to her, be it unto you according to your faith that she went back home and God heard her prayer and gave her a child. And so she brought, so she didn't go back to the temple yearly like they used to do. And she told her husband until I've win this child. And again, the reason why I used 12 years old, because if you read the story of when um, Abraham had a feast for um, Isaac, when he was born, you realize that he was about 12 years old because Ishmael was 13 at that point. So it's like the, the winning of the sons in that time was around 12 years old, which is kind of where you would finish the primary school. Um, if you were school in the UK, for example. Um, so verse 27 and 28 says, I, when she brought the boy back to the temple to serve, to tell Eli to serve, he says, I prayed for this boy and the Lord has given me the request that I asked of him. Now I dedicate him to the Lord. From this time on, he's dedicated to the Lord. Then, he watched, then they worship the Lord there. Okay, so again, we see this story of Samuel being dedicated to God, not because he wanted to, Okay, not because he wanted to um, be the person to be dedicated to the Lord. We see a different example of Samuel at roughly 12, if we go by the math I just presented earlier, that being brought to the temple and being consecrated to God, being given to God fully to serve him. And then we read the story later, if you carry on reading for the rest of, through, through the chapters in 1 Samuel, you see that God appeared to Samuel while he was in the temple. So he literally was sleeping in the temple when God appeared to him and told him some things about Eli's son, about the future of Israel and so on. And we know that he became someone that was so instrumental, okay, in, in bringing God's will to pass upon Israel and being the prophet that led Israel 
um, from that from judges to judges to judges, and then there was Samuel. And the Bible says of him that none of his words fell to the ground. So again, we see that consecration is always tied to a purpose God has for that individual life. It is not just um, something. It's not just random. It's not just something random. Okay, there's purpose always with consecration. The third example I'd like to give is the Rechabites, which you may or may not have heard, but we read their story in Jeremiah 35, verse um, one to eleven. Um, they were a tribe that were resident with the children of Israel at that point. Um, so he says, this is the message the Lord gave Jeremiah when Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, was king of Judah. Go to the settlements where the families of the Rechabites live and invite them to the Lord's temple. Take them into one of the inner rooms and offer them some wine. So I went to see Jazaniah, son of Jeremiah and grandson of Habazaniah, and all his brothers and sons representing all the Rechabite families. I took them to the temple and we went into this room assigned to the sons of Hannah, son of Igdaliah, a man of God. This room was located next to the one used by the temple officials directly above the room of Masaiah, son of Shalom, the temple gatekeeper. I set cups and jugs of wine before them and invited them to drink and they refused. But they refused. No, they said, we don't drink wine. Because our ancestor, Johanadab, son of Rechab, gave us this command. You and your descendants must never drink wine and do not build houses or plant crops or vineyards, but always live in tents. If you follow these commands, you will live long, good lives in the land. So we have obeyed them, obeyed him in all these things. We have never had a drink of wine to this day, nor have our wives, our sons or our daughters. We haven't built houses or owned vineyards or farms or planted crops. We have lived in tents and have fully obeyed all the commands of Jehonadab, our ancestor. But when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon attacked this country, we were afraid of the Babylonian and Syrian armies. So we decided to move to Jerusalem. This is why we are here. And again, you see a tribe that has decided to consecrate certain things in their life because their ancestor gave them that command with, with almost like a reward attached to it. Okay, to say, if you do this, if you don't live in tents, if you don't build houses, if you don't plant vineyards, if you live, if you, if you don't live in houses, rather, if you live in tents instead and you don't drink strong wine, they refuse even when a priest of God came to convince them to do otherwise, to show you the power of consecration. Okay, um, so a whole tribe lived the consecrated life just because their ancestors said so, just because somebody has said, this is what you're supposed to do. So another example that we know quite, we probably know quite well is the tribe of Levi. So these were Levites, Aaron and his sons and his descendants were consecrated to serve as priests, no work, they could not have their own jobs, no haircuts, no alcohol, they could only marry another Levite. So for example, we see with Zacharias and Elizabeth who were the parents of John the Baptist. So these were people that God had selected for himself to, for himself rather, to do certain things and to live a certain way. Again, it's so key for the purpose that he had attached to their lives, okay? So consecration can therefore be something that God calls us to do or something that we decide to do ourselves, something that we decide to subject ourselves to. But in the end, it's a case of we're fulfilling a purpose that God has in mind. So what God has shown us, what God has taught us. One of the things that has been preached to us at the Covenant Nation is that beyond going for our own goals, beyond going for our own dreams, our own desires, whatever it is we think where we want to achieve this year, in the next five years, in the next 10 years, is to sit down and ask, God, what exactly, I, what exactly do you have in mind for me? What exactly do you want me to do? And when we get that download from God, that will require, that might require a few things from us. It might require us to set aside, set aside times of prayer and fasting. It might require us to do, to give up on doing certain things. It might require us to maybe, as we talked in our last week's session, going to bed a certain time, waking up a certain time, or living out certain things in our lives. So it's important that we bear in mind that in our acts of consecration, in our acts of dying to flesh, in our acts of giving up our food, turning down our plates, not drinking wine, not doing certain things, um, it's not just for the fun of it. It's not because we are trying to, I don't know, increase our willpower. It's because there's a call of God upon our lives, either in a season or as, a, as our lives um, in general. So we see in the case of Samuel, for example, that he became a powerful prophet and a priest who ended up anointing two kings over Israel. So he anointed Saul as the first king of Israel and he anointed David as the person that would take over from him. So with everything that God calls us, every, every point where there's a consecration, every point where there is a laying down of self, every point where there is a giving up of something, either as a lifestyle or over a short term, um, there is a purpose that God is trying to establish. This is something that God is trying to achieve, okay? So a good question um, at this point to ponder on would be like, what has God called us to, God you to do with your time on earth? And if we bring that, peel that back in, we can see what has God, what is God, what demand is God placing on your life as a result for the year 2024? What is he saying that you have to do? What things, what's, what, do, what processes do you have to start putting in place to make sure that you are not, that we're not losing out because of the, as it's where the lust of the flesh, the lust of the, of, of the eyes and the pride of life to make sure that everything, everything 
that God has for us, everything that God has shown us, we can actually walk into it. So what, di what dimension of consecration does God, does that call you to? Is it a case of fasting? Is it a case of living a fasted life? Is it a case of skipping one meal a day? Is it a case of avoiding TV? Is it a case of not listening to certain things? So I remember I, I have a friend who, whose husband would, can watch anything he wants to watch. So let's say he, things like, not necessarily horror, but not, not too far from it either, didn't bother him at all. But for her, even if she watched something as simple as, let's say, Tom and Jerry, that would just mess up with her mind. Any Tom and Jerry, maybe they are spreading their clothes, those, those funny scenes, and maybe there was a fire at the end and it was burning their clothes. That would just not be the thing for her. So she knew from the get-go that anything that is beyond a certain thing, she's not going to subject her mind to it. Not because she couldn't as an adult, but because of the implications it had on her mind and her ability to have a mind that is still and is calm and is peaceful. So consecration can be a lifetime as it was in the case of Samuel, or it can be um, or an, and of Samson and even of John the Baptist, or it can be short, short term. So like Paul did, I think at some point he wanted to bring, I think it was Timothy um, into the temple and they were like, oh, you can't do this because his mother is Greek or something like that. And he had to consecrate himself and Timothy as well and become like a Nazarite for that certain period of time so that he could fulfill some certain vows and be able to speak to the people in that land. So it's quite important that we understand what God is calling us to do. It wouldn't look like anybody else else's. It might be somebody else might be asked to do something else. That, that's not for you. Our job when God calls us, when God shows us this is what he wants to do, is like, God, how do, I, how do I make sure that this gets fulfilled in my life? Okay? So it can involve, it usually would it involve abstinence from certain things for specific times and for specific purposes. So it can be dedicated times of prayer and fasting alone. It can be taking retreats. It can be um, turning off the TV. It can be reading certain books. It can be a commitment to devote the word of God in a year. It can be a commitment to be more charitable, more generous in our giving. It can be a commitment to fellowshiping with other Christians. It can it, it would demand different things of us. But the common one that you would find with most of us is the, uh, the thing about prayer and fasting. And um, so I think it's quite important that we think about these things in, in terms of what is God asking me to do for the thing he's placed upon my life to do. And it usually would it require some sort of sacrifice. Okay. So an example that came to mind while I was thinking about this is the example of um, Jephthah, for example. It was one of, I think he was one of the judges in the Bible where he was going to fight on behalf of the Israelites and probably out of fear or uncertainty, he made a vow to God that whatever came out of his house, as soon as he came back from war victorious, he was going to sacrifice um, unto God, you know. And fortunate, unfortunately, as it were, it was his daughter that came out to greet him, okay. I don't know the full, I can't remember the full story right now, whether he actually did go ahead with it. But I wouldn't, I, would, I wouldn't think he did if, um, I hope he didn't, but we don't know that for sure. So the other types of consecration that can happen for specific use of things in the temple. So we know that the, all the ornaments, all the golden cups, all the incense, all the censers, all, all sorts of different things were consecrated for the use in the temple of God during biblical times. So we read the story of the King Belshazzar, who was the son or the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, who in, I think, um, in, the, in the book of Daniel, went and asked his men to bring out all the gold and silver cups from the temple to use in their drinking and, and you know, reveling and all of that. Um, and then that was when the hand came and wrote on the wall because God is particular about those things or those people he has called to consecrate themselves to them. He was immediately judged that the, that the kingdom had departed from him type of thing. So we can decide to also, the other way of consecration works is we can decide to consecrate, dedicate physical things also to God. So for example, you might buy a house or buy a car um, and you are saying, God, I consecrate this house to you. I consecrate this car to you. It's going to be used for things, only things that are holy. It's going to be used for the Lord's work only. Um, my house is only going to accommodate only things that are holy, that are true, that are honest. Like we read in the last episode, um, we heard in the last episode, Philippians 4, 8, things that are true, things that are honest, things that are just, things that are pure of a good report, things that have virtue and things that have praise. This is what this car would be used for. This is what this house would be used for. Uh, we also do it when we give birth. When we, when we have um, new babies, we bring them to church and we dedicate them to the Lord um, because there's also some level of protection in the things that are consecrated to God. We see God's jealousy. If God can be jealous over the things in the temple being used in a, in a way that was not holy and sacred before him, we see his jealousy against that. So I'm sure when we dedicate our children, when we dedicate our things to God, the jealous eyes of God are upon those things to protect and to preserve us. Most of us will undergo some kind of consecration. 
most of us that are wanting to grow in our walk with Jesus, wanting to become more like Christ, will grow in our consecration with Jesus with things like fast, like we said earlier, personal retreats to see God's face, communion with other believers, fellowship with other believers, spending so much time in the word. All these different things would happen um, in, our, in, our, in, in our bids to be people and to fulfill what God has asked us to do. So the final example I was going to give is we see in Jesus, beyond his dedication as the firstborn son in the temple, he was set apart for the purpose God has called him to do. And anything that didn't align with that, anything that didn't align with that was a no-no for him. Um, and we see it was the purpose of him dying on the cross for every single person in the world, um, even those yet unborn at the point where he died, to, be, to, become, to come back to be children of God. He died for everyone's sin. That was his purpose. That was the reason why he came to earth to show us the way to God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Um, to show us the way to God, that is the reason why he came. So just to wrap up um, this session, the main thing for us to understand is whatever, there are two things. One is from the examples I gave, it looked like the people God called to be consecrated to him were given, were people that were born out of, out of need. So you see this, the example of Hannah and the example of Samson's parents not having children. It was almost like there was a need and then God used that to effect his purpose on the earth. So if there's a need in your life, if there's something that seems to be lacking, I think it's a good prayer or a good um, time to go to God and say, Lord, there's this thing that I've been praying and praying to you about that is not working. What, ex what exactly are you seeking to do through it on the earth? What exactly is your plan and purpose? Because I've prayed, I've fasted, I've done everything that I need to do, I know to do, and it still hasn't happened. Is there something else that you're, you're trying to establish? So for example, we might say Hannah wanted a son, but God wanted a prophet to come into Israel, you know, at that point in time. So what exactly it is, is it that God is asking or God wants to effect? And then in our obedience and our surrender to him, he does two things. He gives us that need. And at the same time, he, through us, he fulfills his purpose on the earth. The second thing is to focus our minds to saying, whatever God has called us to consecrate, the Bible says it gives us the, uh, the power both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So it's not in our own strength. So we also said last week that to rely on the Holy Spirit to help us, to strengthen us. So if he says get up by 3 a.m., for example, like if I said last week, um, to pray, we're not thinking, oh my God, I go to bed at 10, I won't be, I'll be tired for work. No, we're asking the Holy Spirit, how do I adjust my day? How do I adjust my calendar so that I can fulfill this thing, this demand that the Spirit of God is placing on my life? Um, yes, consecration is that deep. Um, others may I cannot, doesn't always apply to something that is necessarily sin or necessarily evil. Um, but we trust that as we, as you go into this week, um, you would start thinking and asking these questions so, so that your life is one, our lives are ones that honor God. Um, and fulfill what God has asked us, asked us to do. We're not doing things haphazardly. So until next week, when we come to you with another episode of In a Nutshell, I hope you have an amazing week and I hope you got something out of this and you were blessed and we shall see you next week. Ciao.